Welcome to the Grow Strong Leaders podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and I interview business leaders who are committed to their own growth and the development of everyone on their team. If you enjoy my podcast, be sure to subscribe and rate it on your favorite podcast platform. Thank you for joining me today. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and I love to bring on as guests people who are focused on their own development and also on helping other people realize their potential. You're going to love my guest today because she has focused in both of these areas during her career, and she has some great and important insights to share. You're going to love learning from her. I'd like to say welcome to Michelle Braden as my guest today. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Michelle, I'm so glad you are with me. I loved our earlier conversation, and there are so many things I want to tap into um, in your insights and experiences. First, let me introduce you to my audience. Michelle is the Vice President of Global Talent Development at WEX, and that company is a leading provider of corporate payment solutions. She likes to call herself the Chief learning evangelist at WEX, and you'll see why during our conversation today. Michelle has more than 25 years of successful management experience in companies like TELUS International, SAP, and Xerox. Do you know, Michelle, one thing that you had shared with me is your background is different from most learning and development leaders. So tell us briefly about your journey and how those experiences have shaped the approach you take? Well, I started my career as a software developer. So many, many, many years ago, (laughs) I think I learned using card decks and things like that, but software engineering. And and then, you know, I I found that the the higher I rose in the, up the ladder, the fewer people I got to actually be interacting with. And so, I was one of those people that they said, we need to teach the end users how to use this software. Can you teach them? And so I did. And then I, you know, started doing other roles like um, marketing support, sales support, traveling with the salespeople at different companies, and then finally wound up into a sales position myself. And so with that technology and that sales background, you, you gather a lot of new skills that you probably wouldn't gather if you started in HR and moved up to learning and development. So, but when I was in sales was where I really got interested in training because I wouldn't take the shrink wrap off of the stuff they sent us to train. I was like, this is horrible training. So I was trying to figure out how can I make something that's better? And that that was my for that was my entry really into the training organization. And then you moved into leadership roles and I, I know you had kind of an aha moment um, back in 2006 when you attended a leadership course that really turned around how you thought of yourself, I think, as a leader and how you behaved as a leader. Talk about what happened. So I, I thought I was a great manager. I thought I was one of the best. Like I knew everything. I knew how to do the job. I could show other people how to do the job. I could teach other people. But I attended the Ken Blanchard Situational Leadership Workshop. It was just two days. And as we're sitting there going through the workshop, I'm suddenly, it's suddenly dawning on me that I'm probably not a good manager. (laughs) I'm, I'm doing everything wrong. And I was really focused on the work that my team was doing and not on the people in my team. And I had a woman who was reporting to me who was, she owed me a prototype of something that she was working on and I couldn't get her to deliver. I kept saying, when are you going to have this? When are you going to have this? When are you going to have, you know, the typical manager thing. And I went to the course and I learned about how you need to understand where they are in their development cycle. And do you direct them or do you coach them? Do you support them or do you delegate to them? And I guess I was doing a lot of directing and a lot of delegating because I was not doing any coaching or supporting. That night, I went home and I really thought about it. And I contacted her and I said, "Um, you know, you've done this work before. I did the supporting, style three. 
you've done this work before. You're so good at it. And you've re remember the time you did blah, 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 blah. I did everything like by the book. And the very next day she delivered the prototype. And I was like, oh my gosh, this works. <laughs> and I've used it ever since, ever since. And it's become part of my natural leadership style. And I brought that program into every company I've been in. And people go to that program and they're just like, eye-opening you know it's like it's something something so small so yet so powerful it's just a two-day workshop I, I don't think there are very many leadership programs that can really turn around somebody so quickly mm -hmm. that's such a great um example though of how I think you must have been ready too and having had that experience with that one employee fresh in your mind and and kind of struggling with what do I do I think you're you're then more open to hearing what's the solution I haven't considered yet for solving this problem right yeah exactly uh, you, the the student was ready and the right information showed up at the right time well one of the things also that you do as a leader um is you you have a philosophy of challenging and supporting your team members. And I think that's a tricky balance. It goes back to looking at, you know, the different um, situational leadership roles, but in particular, challenge support, challenge support. How does that work? Well, first off, that's, that is a tricky thing. And it, and it takes confidence and courage to do it. I think, and, and I think I take a bit of compassion because it, as a leader, I mean, first off, I tell people that my leadership grew immensely when I learned how to do that. I I used to, you know, even with the situational leadership, I would do the coaching and supporting, but I'd still be a little bit where I was afraid of what are they going to do if I don't tell them how to do this? You know, if I don't give them all the answers and the boundaries and all these things, what's going to happen? Oh, are we going to have something horrible? Are they going to ruin it? And I remember the first time I really let this group go and I said, okay, here's what we need to accomplish. And here are some parameters, go for it. And they were like, well, I'm the, you know, they're waiting for the direction. And I'm like, no, I'm not gonna tell you any direction. I'm gonna, I challenge you guys to go figure out, you're the experts at this and this and this, go figure this out and come back and show me what you came up with. And the first time that happened, I was so scared. I was like petrified. What is going to happen? I've really, like I've let go. I guess like that, you know, the child that you like go off to school the first day or the, the bird flying out of the nest. And they came back with something that was absolutely amazing. And I was like, huh, I never even thought of this as an option. It wasn't even in my and all the things I thought they'd come back with, this was not one of them, but it was great. And I was like, huh, that's the way I get them to innovate. They use their knowledge, their skills. I give them like a challenge and a new direction to go in kind of like a, with boundaries. And they're expanding what they're trying to do, but I'm getting something completely different and innovative out of it. So it was a great experience for me. And I... I thought, okay, I'm going to do it again. And I did it again. And I did it again. And now my team teases me because they're like, we know how you work. We know what you do. You challenge us. And I said, well, it is an accelerated development strategy. Because if you talk to people on my team, you would find out on, on teams I have now and I've had in the past, that they grow at a faster rate in their skills and capabilities because of the challenges that they're given because they're empowered to go figure things out with the skills and knowledge that they have that I don't necessarily have and they grow at a faster pace and so I've been told that people are like you know they're working on stuff today that they would have had to wait 10 years to work on had they been working for someone else mm. and so and supported by someone else by the way I will say that word support is really critical because what I do tell my team is, look, you go try it. I'm going to be here behind you. If you fall, I'll help you. I'll get you back on track. But you, I want you out here trying it. 
So they know that I'm going to support them. I don't throw them under the bus when they fail. We go through it as what did, what did you learn from it? You know, what are you going to do differently next time? And then we go forward. So it's, it's a safe environment for them to try things. That's so critical. I love that combination that um, you've given. And I'd love to hear what, what feedback do you get from people? I think you were mentioning that someone had joined your team from another team internal to the company, I think. And she said, you're the best leader I've ever had. So what are some of the things that she specified you did or that you didn't do that caused her to say that? Because before you answer, I think this is this is something that a lot of leaders aspire to, not necessarily from an ego perspective, but from the impact they've had, that somebody would feel they were the best boss they'd ever worked for. So you've had that kind of feedback. So what did you do? So I think... Um, and, and she has given me that direct feedback. She actually gave it to my manager as well, which was very nice of her, but she didn't mean to do that. But she had been with the company a really long time and, and she hadn't really had a leader who had been transparent um, with information, had not really supported her, given her feedback on you know things that could be improved, coached her. They hadn't coached her at all. And she said to me, I wish I'd had you 25 years ago as my leader, which I thought was really nice. Um, but she, one of the things that I'm very open with my team, um, I, I won't say, I mean, I don't give away all the secrets, right? But I'm very transparent about what's going on and, and I let them know my motives behind some of the decisions that I've made, et cetera. But I think the other thing is, and, I, and this dawned on me last week, actually, Meredith, that I started looking at different people and I'm kind of thinking there's like this spectrum of, you know, execution on one end and highly visionary on the other end. And where the best leaders are is they're in the middle. And, but what happens is we get these leaders who rise to the top because they're great at getting stuff done because they're executioners. You know, they, they, exec, they execute things like nobody's business. They, they're organized, they're planful, they do all these different things, but they can't see the forest for the trees. So they can't see where we need to go. And one of the things she said to me was, you're one of the first leaders that's ever been three steps ahead. Like you're always thinking three steps ahead. And so the things we're doing today, you know, we all think this is it, but you know, it's just the step towards the next two or three things that you have on the list. So in essence, she also said, you're very strategic. And I would say back to my spectrum here, my line, I think the you can be strategic and be and also get things done. But if you are only getting things done, if you only know how to go through the punch list, you're not going to be a good people leader because the, people need to see where we're headed. They need to see the vision. They need to see why are we going that direction. And with her, she felt like she never had that before. She never could see. It was more about just do the punch list, basically. If you have trouble with something, do it. What's that? Put your head down and get the work done. Exactly. And it goes back to that, is it the work or is it the people? I mean, Marcus Buckingham talks about this. You know, it's about the people. It's not about the work. You got to focus on the people. And I think, you know, for me, I, I think that's one of the things that has had such an impact on my career. And it, it wasn't, it's not just from him, but from other people, like, you know, giving feedback, leave their dignity intact. I remember a leader telling me that one day. And um, I remember years and years ago, this is 25, 30 years ago, leader telling me I wasn't empathetic. And now today, anyone you talk to in the last 15 years, it's a Michelle, I'm not empathetic. Oh my God. It's like, yeah, she is empathetic. It's like all these little people along the way and you learn these little things from your different leaders. And I think I've just kind of encapsulated them all into this way that I work and it's unusual. And I also don't think that every leader goes out and tries to improve their leadership, by the way. I think they, they get rewarded because they're getting stuff done, but they don't, re they, if they were rewarded more for you know how they get things done and being more visionary along the way, 
they probably would improve their leadership a lot. Mm, such a good point. I want to go back to what you were talking about with being empathetic, because, you know, time and again, um, my guests mention empathy as being so important. I'm curious how you define it. What does that look like? And what are some examples of situations where you have shown empathy to someone on your team, let's say, and, and it's made a difference? So I mean, I, I have people, I have someone right now that's going through a pretty tough health situation. And I don't, I'm not going to, you know, kick them while they're down and say, get this, deliver this, deliver. So I think being empathetic is realizing that they're going through this health situation. They're not going to be on in top performance mode, but that's okay. And we don't have to always be top performers and, but they'll still be delivering. And the funny thing is, the more I tell that person, stop being so hard on yourself, stop trying to be top performer right now, the higher they perform mm -hmm. and while they're going through this situation. And not that I'm trying to make that happen, but I also think there's, I, I've had people work for me, other managers work for me that um, they would criticize people on their team, things at the end. And I'm being empathetic to me, I'd say to them, well, you know, you need to think about what they're going through. Like what's happening with them right now? Like be, I always say err on the side of compassion. That's like one of my phrases I use a lot. And it, it's true because I remember I went to the Zig Ziglar class years and years and years ago called See You at the Top. And mm -hmm. when I was at Xerox and had, that's another thing that left a little impression on me. He says, just remember who kicked their cat. Like if someone's being mean to you, someone's in a bad mood or, you know, you're walking down the hallway and they normally say hi, but now they're, they're looking down, they're not even making eye contact. And you're like, gosh, why are they mad at me? And he'd say, it's not about you. It's about something that they probably, maybe they just had a fight on the phone, an argument with their spouse, or they just got bad news about something. Who knows what it is? It's not about you. And so I, I remember that a lot. And I think, I, I, I also know a woman I worked with that used to say, um, when someone was acting weird, she'd say, must be really hard to be them. <laughs> I was like, yeah, it must be really hard to be them. And that's all she'd say. And I thought, that, if that's not being empathetic, I don't know what is, right? To take that perspective and think about it that way. Yeah. Yeah. It. It. I love that. Who kicked the cat? <laughs> Just to, <laughs> well, it's this whole idea of putting yourself in their place. Yeah. Um, moment to try to imagine what is it they're going through. And I think it's so easy to take things personally. In fact, you and I love um, the four agreements and you had shared with me about the fifth agreement because of course one of those four agreements has everything to do with not taking things personally. It's right. about you. You're a big advocate of the fifth agreement and, and how it applies to critical thinking. I would love to have you share what is that fifth agreement and how does it make this connection to critical thinking? So, you know, you're getting my interpretation of it because I interpret these <laughs> things. Yeah. And I, I, never, I, I admit I've never read the four agreements cover to cover, but I know the four agreements well, and I've put them in Michelle's mode, but it is like, and they changed, that was another thing that changed my life, the four agreements. And I quote that book all the time. But the fifth agreement is about being skeptical. And... One of the things that this is one of my former team members at my last company, she remembered when I, and I've completely forgotten this, when I left, she said, yep, critical thinking leads to learning. I remember you said that on day one when you came in here. And I said, I did say that. I didn't remember it, but I did say that. But critical thinking to me, so being skeptical means think critically about stuff. Just because somebody says, you know, this is how it is, doesn't mean this is how it is. I mean, what what do we, what do you mean it as is how it is? And so it's like always challenge, and it gets back to that challenging the status quo, right? Really saying, is there something different that we can do? We just had um, Aaron Dignan. I don't know if you know him. He wrote uh, Brave New Work. He mm -hmm. he came and spoke at this event that we did last week, and he's just like so amazing the way he talks about non radical change. 
he's talking about radical change in a non-radical scale. And he talks about challenging the status quo. Like just because it's, you know, written on, you know, paper that's lined with gold on the outside edge doesn't mean it can't be changed, right? And it's all these, these kind of things you, you pick up through your career. Remember in a negotiation class, same thing, picking up, you know, just because the wine list is printed and has a nice leather bound <laughs> cover and it's got the gold edging doesn't mean that's what you have to pay for the wine. And that, so our challenge was to go in and negotiate the price of a Dom Perignon from 150 down. I got it down to 75. I mean, it's like, and you're like, okay, I challenged it. I did it. So it gives you more confidence that, you know, in things at work, it's not, you don't want to be like the person who is like the devil's advocate. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is really thoughtfully, intentionally looking at things and saying, does it make sense? Is it logical? Is this going to get the outcome that we want to have? Or is it something that we're just doing and because we've always done it and it's adding all this bureaucracy? Maybe we don't need to do all those steps. Maybe that's not necessary anymore. Let's look at a different way. As long as it's driving you towards that outcome or that goal that you're trying to get to, there's a million ways to get there. Mm -hmm. You know, I, as I was listening to you think about challenging the status quo, it came to me thinking about people who do tend to be negative, you know, or very critical. And I was interested in hearing your distinction between those two. If you are talking to someone that tends to see the dark side or the negative or why this won't work, what are some things that you say or do that help to move the conversation forward so you don't get mired into an argument around their perspective and where you're trying to take things? Well, you know, I think questions are great. I mean, questioning and questioning and questioning and questioning. Um, one of the things is, um, you know, using active listening is not a strong suit for a lot of leaders. They don't, they don't really listen. They listen for what they want to hear. Um, when you have a conflict with another person, like they're negative or they're angry or whatever it is, I think the best thing to do, and this is what I've actually taught before, is, you know, stop and try to understand from their perspective, what is it that they're wanting? And you can only find that out by asking questions. Like you can't assume, that's one of the four agreements, don't assume. And you can't take it personal that they're just negative because of you, because it's probably something in them. So it's like, try to understand where they're coming from. What are they, what are they negative about? What are they upset about? And asking those questions. It's, it's kind of like a little bit of a coaching technique in, you know, you're trying to understand, you know, okay, what's the worst that would happen if we did this? You know, what are some alternatives? What are the, you know, just kidding. I, I, I avoid the question why, because why gets people defensive, but what and how and who and when and where, all these other questions to try to really peel back the layers and understand where are they coming from? And I, I, I just had this conversation this week with one of my leaders on my team that, you know, is having a situation with an employee and we talked through that, same thing. Don't tell them what to do. Start asking what, you know, not why, but what are you going to do? How are you going to approach this? What is your plan for this? And it forces them to think through it and they can't hide behind the, you know, the why, they have to think through it and they have to really share what they're what they're working on. And, and it gives it clears, it almost clears the air a little bit. So then then it's like once you find that out and you find out the you know all the details, you can kind of grab onto one of the little commonalities that maybe you have and they have, like, you know, like, oh, so and then you start in your, you know, your kind of yes and yes, and we can do this and we can do that. And it's, you know. It's an interesting technique. It works, um, but not everyone has the patience to do it, by the way. Well, you know, the thing is, but what I think you've just said is so brilliant. It makes so much sense, and it is actually common sense. However, like you say, many folks think it takes too much time. I don't have time for that. And yet, if they don't take the time now to slow down and address this, then it's one of those areas of friction that's going to keep happening 
sometimes subconsciously, but our attitude toward another person can be developed, you know, with a single encounter that we then bring to future encounters, which doesn't serve us or them very well. Yeah, at all. It's true. And I think there's an assumption by people that everyone thinks the same and everyone's the same. And um, someone said to me last week, I think so-and-so doesn't like me. And I said, why do you think that? And they said, well, because whenever I say something, they give me this look. And I said, that's because they're processing what you just said. It's not that they don't like you. They're trying to understand and internalize what you just said. People process. And that was another piece of advice from a leader that I had years and years ago because I had a woman on my team. I'm like, she just, you know, I tell her this and she does this. And she goes, she needs to process. Slow down. It's like that, you know, it was it slow down, think fast, whatever it is, that book. I, I never can remember the name of that book. But anyway, um, it's it's really important that you realize that some people are quick processors and, you know, they're extroverted and they throw things out and they throw ideas out there to get someone's reaction. Whereas a lot of the people who are more introverted are thinking through it before they actually say anything because mm -hmm. they're not sure how people are going to react. And, Quite frankly, they're not sure they can handle the reaction. So they're like, you know, they take their time. So it's, you got to understand that when you're dealing with people, they're not all, we're not all the same, right? One size fits one. That's good. I hadn't heard that one. <laughs> I like that. Well, I know another one of your roles there is coaching executives and leaders. And you had shared with me that one of the things that, um, they fall into is being what you call the answer person. So talk about what what kind of a trend do you see there? What is that behavior? And then how do you coach them and help them realize it's not serving them or the other person very well? It's funny because we have a leadership program and we did three, we have do we do three sixties. And and for a while there I was coaching a lot of the participants. And I when I looked at their 360s, it had something around from their direct reports around whether or not their direct reports listen to them and let them solve problems. And they're like, I never get to solve any problems. My boss always tells me what the answer is. And so I coach them around taking that. The, again, it goes back to what I said before with the you know conflict is asking the questions and listening to the answers. And then it get and it's also the challenge too. It goes back to the challenging we talked about at the beginning. It's like it challenges people to think, and it's that critical thinking. It all it's like a red thread that goes through the whole thing. It's like it just gives people the sense that oh, I need to think about this. Let me think about this. And if you do it in such a way that it's not like an interrogation, but it's more of a curiosity, you know, like. I'm just curious, like, how do you think, I mean, you have done this before, so I assume, you know, you know they have the, the knowledge about whatever, and you've done this before. Let's think about how could we do this, knowing what you know, how can we do this in this given situation? And they start thinking through it, and it becomes a problem-solving exercise, which I think problem-solving is like, I don't know, I used to say new influencing was the number one skill, I think problem solving is probably taking over influencing or close second because that problem solving skill that you help others develop is going to carry them a long way in their career because there's going to be all sorts of problems. There's going to be business problems. There's going to be people problems, all sorts of problems that are going to pop up. So they, and they look at me, it's funny when I, coach them on this and ask them, do you ask questions in these meetings? They go, well, no, I, I mean, we, we have a short time for the meeting. Got to get this in. I'm like, what if you ask some questions? What if you took a step back and asked a few questions? And they're like, oh, okay. You know, and I've had leaders come back to me and say, I did that. And it was amazing what I learned. And I'm like, really? Tell me more. And they're like, I learned this person wants to do this and this. They have this background and I didn't know that and I'm like wow it's amazing amazing what you learn so as a result of your coaching them do you see them changing their behavior over time to ask more questions and do you get feedback 
from them or people who work with them about the difference and what they like about it? I, I get feedback from both. I've had leaders come to me and say, Michelle, you got to help me fix this person. They've got, they have this issue, their team hates them, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, I work with the person for a few months and then I never hear a word. And I'm like, is everything going okay? <laughs> and I'll run into the leader and they'll, oh yeah, he's great. Their team loves him and they're doing this and doing that. It's funny how it's almost like the squeaky wheel. Like you don't hear when it, when it's going well. You hear when it's broken. So mm -hmm. I often think, okay, I'm not hearing anything, so I guess that's good. And then I might circle around and check with somebody else and find out. So um, they never really come back and go, Michelle, that changed my life. And blah, blah, blah. You know, they don't do that. But their team is happier. Their boss is happier. Their stakeholders are happier. And that's all I care about. I don't need the accolades for them doing that. So I want to see the actual results of that coaching. I think that's what what helps coaches be a little more humble because I the coaches who are expecting people to come in and go, thank you so much, you saved my life. Those people are doing it for all the wrong reasons. All the wrong reasons. Well, I would love to kind of wrap up by having you talk about what are some of the what you would, because you've alluded to some of them and actually mentioned some of them overtly, but what are some of the other ways that you have personally grown? What are some insights you've continued to gain over the years that you feel have helped you be that best kind of leader that other people love to work with? I think one of the things that's really important is to have great relationships with your team and to not be so hierarchical that you can't have these really good conversations. I have one person on my team, I call her my intellectual debater. And she and I will get into really deep conversations. I learned so much. She's about 30 years younger than me and has her PhD, but she's, I learned so much from her. And I think having that relationship is really important. I've had other people on my team who are open to giving me feedback which I think is great. I love getting that. I, I remember one time when I, you know, I, I was like, let's get this done. And this, you know, we got to do this, we got to do that. And we accomplished so much as a team. This was at another company. We'd accomplished so much. And this person who reported to me um, said, uh, Michelle, we've accomplished a lot, but I think it's time to give recognition. <laughs> like, oh yes, recognition. <laughs> but it's like taking, I think, from a leader perspective, we are not the knowers of all. And as long as we're willing to accept feedback from anyone, actually, and, you know, I don't accept third-party feedback, by the way. I have a rule against that. Like, if someone wants to say something, they want to give me feedback, they need to give it to me directly. Because this three-way thing, this triangulating does not work. No. And so I think from a leader perspective, too, that's another insight. Don't allow people to do that. Don't allow people to do that, like, on your team. Have someone on your team come and say, hey, here's this and this and this. And someone said, someone said this and no, I don't allow that at all. So I think there's like all these different pieces that you can pick out through your career. But relationships are number one. You've got to have really strong relationships with the people you work with, the colleagues and who report to you and your manager. Um, I try to keep my manager kind of out of stuff. Like I like to protect her so that she doesn't have to get involved. And I'm not, I'm not keeping secrets, but it's like, you need to take care of things down here. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's like my greatest um, insight to how you really get ahead, by the way, is protecting that layer above you. So they're not getting into the minutia because they don't need to be, they've got bigger things to work on. Mm -hmm. Those are, both really great, the uh, relationships with your own team members, with your colleagues, and then understanding what that really means to work with your own manager effectively, what to share, what not. Um, it, you know, it sounds like you apply yourself without your manager coaching you, what you coach your employees to do in terms of thinking crit critically and problem solving yourself. And um, it sounds like you've got a wonderful team that you're working with. That I have a great team. All kinds of 
um, stimulation to your thinking that that serves all of you really well. Yeah. Michelle, this has just been so much fun. I knew that it would be a great conversation. You are a font of wisdom. <laughs> you really are. I love your openness. What you shared in this interview and how you were being in this interview to me is just a microcosm of how you are with your team. You know, that openness, the vulnerability, your your ability to laugh at your own mistakes and, you know, how you've handled things so you don't take yourself too seriously. Because I think that's a key aspect of being as effective as you are. That caring comes through, that empathy. Um, but also there's, um, while you have the seriousness, there's a lightness too. Does that resonate with you? Do you feel that that's accurate? Yeah, Oh. Uh Absolutely. And I, I think it comes with, part of it comes with uh, age, part of it comes with failing a lot. <laughs> I've, I've probably made of every mistake that you can make. So um, I think all that comes, uh, you know, that's how you, you gain that wisdom. And I, and I, and I love that you notice that I'm not, it's not about me. I tell my team this all the time. I came here to help the company and help them and build this organization. I'm going to retire one of these days and I want to just leave. You know, I don't want them to go, oh my God, Michelle's leaving. But I want to just leave. And it's just, it's, that's how it is. It's not about me. It's about them. That's great. Well, Michelle, I know I have listeners who are going to want to connect with you, learn more about you and your work at WEX. So please share, how can they do that? I think the best way is through LinkedIn, actually, is to find me on LinkedIn. And I, I check my messages every day and I respond to a lot of different people. So I'd say that's the best way. Okay, very good. Well, thank you again for being with me today and for sharing your experiences, your lessons learned, because they clearly serve you well, as well as the folks on your team. I just love who you are and what you're doing there. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for tuning in to my podcast. Now head over to growstrongleaders.com and check out our two books, Connect With Your Team and Peer Coaching Made Simple. While you're there, download the free facilitator guide to find out how to implement our unique peer coaching system. Until next time, I'm Meredith Bell.